to welcome you all to the First United Church of East Syracuse, whether you're joining us here in the sanctuary or on one of our social media platforms. We're glad you're with us on this cold, frosty morning. And because it's cold, we want to give an especially warm welcome to our guest pastor this morning, Reverend Monica Styron is here to join us from Skinny Alice. And anybody who can drive that far in this cold weather deserves a nice, warm welcome. So, <laughs> welcome. Thank you. All right. uh, the only announcement that I have this morning is that there are some people who are a little bit concerned that we have not gotten all the committee chair reports in. And so if you please can do that, if you're the head of a committee, get your reports in by this Tuesday the 17th. We'd greatly appreciate that. Thank you very much. Um, next, if you notice, the monitors are not up and running this morning. Um, so Paul is just taping the episode. But if I stumble, you can, I didn't bring any cheating glasses to read today, so I thought they'd be up there, so it could be that, it could be senility, you can take your pick, which way you want to go with that, but all right, here we go. We're all the same <laughs> I'd like to light the candle of remembrance, it's lit for all those in the military and their families, the veterans, the first responders, all those in harm's way, and certainly with the weather we've been having in different parts of the country, there's a lot of people who are in harm's way that we can pray for. And I'll also light the candle of peace that reminds us to pray for peace, God's peace, in our homes, community, the nation, and the world. I read a neat quote this morning in one of the books that I got that said, peace can only come to the people who have peace in their hearts. So, keep your reading on right there. If you join me, please rise as you are able and join me in the call to worship. We gather to worship God. Who creates us and loves us. Who gives us with diversity and makes us for community. Who gives Jesus Christ to show us how to live. Who inspires children, youth, young adults, and people of all ages. who invites us to join the struggle for wholeness and well-being for all. And whose presence, grace, and love sustain us in our living. We gather to worship God. To God, to God be all glory, honor, and praise. Our first hymn this morning is number 334. There's a sweet, sweet spirit.
Would you join me in the prayer of confession, please? Most holy and merciful God, too often we have condemned racial injustice in our pronouncements, yet we cling to the privileges derived from social inequities. All too often we are blind to our complicity in mainstreaming systems of oppression and deferring the hopes and dreams of the oppressed for freedom. Give us the courage to name our sin. Give us the strength to claim responsibility for our actions. Give us the grace to pay the price for changing our behavior. Through Jesus the Christ we pray. Amen. Would you join me in a moment of silence? Please hear the pardon. Friends, believe the good news of the gospel. In Jesus Christ, we are forgiven and loved. It is now the time of our service when we would recognize the passing of the peace. So if you please greet each other in a moment of peaceful communication. morning and I'd like to ask the children to come forward and sit in the front pew if you will just for a very short time I won't bite you I promise <laughs> and they come forward here I have something for you
piggybacking on what Reverend Monica just said, our epistle reading this morning is from the first letter of Paul to the Corinthians. And he is addressing, like Dr. King did, the disparity between the way we treat people. There have been arguments in Corinth about whether I was following Peter or I was following Paul or I was following Apollos. And Paul writes to the church to remind them that we're following Jesus the Christ. Please hear the words of Paul in the book of Corinthians, chapter 1, 1 through 9. Paul, called to be an apostle of Christ Jesus by the will of God and our brother Sosthenes. What? All right. To the church of God that is in Corinth, to those who are sanctified in Christ Jesus, called to be saints together with all those who in every place call on the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, both their Lord and ours. Grace to you and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. I give thanks to my God always for you because of the grace of God that has been given you in Christ Jesus. For in every way you have been enriched in him, in speech and knowledge of every kind, just as the testimony of Christ has been strengthened among you, so that you are not lacking in any spiritual gift as you wait for the revealing of our Lord Jesus Christ. He will also strengthen you to the end, so that you may be blameless on the day of your Lord, or excuse me, of our Lord Jesus Christ. God is faithful. By him you were called into the fellowship of his Son, Jesus Christ our Lord. May God bless the reading of this, his holy word. Our next hymn is number 500, The Spirit of God Descend Upon My Heart.
be seated. Oh, I just lost it back. Come here, Reed. The gospel reading this morning is from the book of John. It's chapter 1, verses 29 to 42. John the Baptist has already baptized Jesus, but now in the continuing saga, he sees him again with a new realization. Please hear the words in our Bible. The next day he saw Jesus coming toward him and declared, Here is the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. This is he of whom I said, After me comes a man who ranks ahead of me, because he was before me. I myself did not know him, but I came baptizing with water for this reason, that he might be revealed to Israel. And John testified, I saw the Spirit descending from heaven like a dove, and it remained on him. I myself did not know him, but the one who sent me to baptize with water said to me, He on whom you see the Spirit descend and remain is the one who baptizes with the Holy Spirit. And I myself have seen and have testified that this is the Son of God. The next day John again was standing with two of his disciples, and as he watched Jesus walk by, he exclaimed, Look, here is the Lamb of God. The two disciples heard him say this, and they followed Jesus. When Jesus turned and saw them following, he said to them, What are you looking for? They said to him, Rabbi, which translated means teacher, where are you staying? He said to them, Come and see. They came and saw where he was staying, and they remained with him that day. It was about four o'clock in the afternoon. One of the two who heard John speak and followed him was Andrew, Simon Peter's brother. He first found his brother Simon and said to him, We have found the Messiah, which is translated anointed. He brought Simon to Jesus, who looked at him and said, You are Simon, son of John. You are to be called Cephas, which is translated Peter. So ends this the reading of his sacred word. Amen. Good morning again. Wow, what a passage. There's just a lot to unpack in this passage, so I'm only going to touch on a few highlights. But first, I wanted to um, just ask you, was there anything in the readings that came across to you as kind of odd or confusing or unexpected? Nothing? For me, for me, it was they were following John the Baptist, and John said, you got to follow him, and then he just switched right off the bat and started following Jesus. Okay, that's a good one. Any other? Special name. Okay. Very good. Any other? Okay. I'm not going to make it painful. <laughs> um, anyway, it is lovely to be with you on this weekend where we celebrate Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. Um, as we enter uh, in, into this epiphany period the, and hear about the revelations about who Jesus was and, um, and what he was up to. In the Gospel of John here we start with the Baptist who, who laid the foundation for what was to be revealed in and through Jesus' life. And I don't know, honestly, if people would have paid that much attention to him as, you know, particularly uh, without the endorsement of John the Baptist uh, confirming that he was the Messiah. Um, we know that we've just come through the Christmas period and the only two Gospels that, are, that report the birth of Jesus uh, uh, are Matthew and, and Luke, whereas in the Gospel of John, the, this time of John the Baptist baptizing Jesus, it's in all four of them. So <clears throat> this is a particularly important Gospel, and I don't know why 
we don't make more of this, you know, or we make so much of some of the, the, and maybe we do better when there's a little more mythology that leaves room and leaves space for, for us to uh, come together like Christmas. Over the next few weeks, these gospel readings will focus on Jesus' teachings and interactions with others, those who followed him and those who were challenged by him. So let's dig in a little bit to this passage as I want to lift up a few things. You all lifted up the names and also um, some of the other things. I want to go back just a, uh, a little further, you know, John pointing to Jesus. I want to go back a little further in the passage um, where John the Baptist, it seems, was preparing for this moment when uh, for some time when he said, I came baptizing with water for this reason, that he might be revealed to Israel. He doesn't re say revealed to himself, but revealed to Israel. That gives you a little hint about the character of, of John. Je Jesus came before me. Uh, John was older. That was kind of an odd thing to say. Uh, so what did he mean there, uh, that Jesus was with God prior to being on earth? So was he pre-existent? Perhaps we are getting a little glimpse of how th this gospel influenced uh, the development of the Trinity concept. And here's another odd one. The Baptist says in verse 31 and 3, twice he says it, he did not know Jesus. Now that one particularly struck me, given that John was older than Jesus and his cousin. So a little digging into what it means in the scriptures to, to know, um, we come out with two different, different meanings. To know as in terms of facts, but also to know in terms of a wider perspective. So, um, so that's, that's just one little one. Verse 29 just jumps out at me. Here is the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. Lamb, is it referring to the nature of a lamb? A lamb was seen as a symbol of, of innocence, gentle, kind, patient, uh, and tolerant. Sounds like the Beatitudes that we're, we're going to hear about. Or was it a reference to his sacrifice? Could it be that Jesus represented us in his baptism? Something, perhaps, to ponder. The word sin is in the singular. The gospel writer was intent on it being singular. We, we love to talk about sins, but <laughs> our own and others. Um, but here, the gospel writer is intent on the word being singular. Thus, it suggests something universal, something in all of humanity. Those who research these, these words find that it means alienation from God and thus from one another. Alienation is the sin of humankind. What we usually confess are the symptoms of alienation and more in line with the individualism of Western Christianity. Rather than seeing ourselves as part of a people, as a society that alienates and separates. The gospel writer John may be connecting the faith community here to the Garden of Eden when he reflected on humanity. And remember, he was around quite a number of years before he wrote this gospel. And his memories would be of violence, the temple being destroyed, uh, and all living under the Roman occupation. So, and also the emphasis on religiosity by the temple leaders who were often over against Jesus and trying, in the end, trying to kill him. So he sees that the religiosity is reinforcing the societal status quo of hierarchies, purity laws, economic burdens through taxation, even in the temples, ostracizing and separating people from one another. We know about the lepers, leopard community and other people. Um, blaming certain groups for committing sins 
uh, all of which supported this alienation of people from one another. In other words, the gospel writers saw that these leaders, religious ones, were missing the spirit of the law. We can understand this status quo mentality when we reflect on the long history in this country of slavery. Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. witness was a witness to the message of Jesus Christ when things came to a boiling point, uh, particularly in the 60s. Uh, for those in our society beaten down by the various and ongoing forms that slavery took. The Civil War, uh, slavery did not end. Uh, after the Civil War, it just took on a new, new habit and continues into this very day. In, the nation, in our nation, it's in the form of systems of governance, economic opportunities, social and religious theology even, and community life. We are blessed, I think, more and more as the veil of gets pulled away from the many ways in which racism uh, affects us and how how, what forms it has taken that keep us separated from one another and cause great suffering. To the black community and those others that our society has marginalized, but also as King witnessed to the white community that can never be whole without our brothers and sisters. He, he was really a person who was embracing what Jesus had to say here. And that's why I believe John the Baptist, what he saw in him, that he embodied uh, the spirit, the Holy Spirit of God. Um, I listened to the radio last week about a report about the mortality rates of infants and mothers in this country as it relates to the world also. And that black women in this country have a much higher percentage, something like 240% times more uh, of deaths than white women. The list goes on for Latina and Native American women. Something for us to think about, that's heartbreaking. We can, in each of our own ways, as a, and as religious communities, act to make corrections and lessen the burdens in this society. What a calling we have to walk with our, our sisters in this situation and with our brothers and other. As one reflects on John the Baptist, you may come to see that, as I pointed out earlier, he wasn't thinking about uh, Jesus coming to him and wasn't he lucky and, you know, to uh, make him something great. He was thinking about what the Messiah could do for Israel, for the people, for society. Um, so he was quite a humble man, uh, even though the images of him are sort of this ragamuffin, you know, homeless guy that comes out of the desert and, you know, is very, oops, is very forceful and strong. On the other hand, this, this part of his character is really very humble. Um, and he refers to Jesus as the one who ranks ahead of me because he was before me. Well, here's another little piece in this scripture. It's like, was he pre-existent then? Uh, I don't know. I mean, that's a whole area that's fascinating. Something for all of us to think about. Rather, he, John, has come to testify. He says, here's my role, and I'm sticking with my role. He's a witness. He is a voice crying in the wilderness that Jesus is the Son of God. That's what he says. Jesus is the Son of God. This is the Messiah. And we heard Dale read. The next day, two of his disciples heard John proclaiming Jesus as the Messiah and for them to follow Jesus. And two of them, Andrew and one other, not mentioned. But who knows who he was. But two of them went. And they started following Jesus. And Jesus turns out, what are you seeking what are you looking for? What's driving you? Why are you following me? A question, I believe, that has to do with the essence of one's life. 
Yes? The essence of our life. What are we seeking? What's driving us? What are we looking for? Then their answer, teacher, where, where are you staying? They wanted to go with him. They wanted to learn from him. Be in his presence. Be in the presence of God, the Son of God. And Jesus turns and says, come and see. Come and see. That's what Jesus says to all of us. Come and see. An invitation to be in relationship with God and with others. An invitation that touches one's heart and mind. I remember as a child, my mother, who was, who was a dental hygienist, along with the dentist that she was working for at the time, took me one evening to give dental treatment to a young pregnant black woman who literally lived on the other side of the tracks. This was out in, in uh, San Diego, California. That so impressed me that we were going to serve her in the night, to serve her, and she was not coming to serve us. It impresses me and continues to impress me that we who are privileged in this society can reach out and serve, serve others, both in our deeds and in advocating for another's worth and dignity for all of those on our shores. We get a picture here in the gospel that without John, the Baptist, John the Baptist, Jesus wouldn't have had some of his first disciples following him. We wouldn't have had the confirmation of Jesus that tied Jesus into the prophecies of old, giving us continuity of God's presence and love and care for us, and God's participation in and with the human family. Nor would we have the recognition that that same Holy Spirit would continue to reveal in and through Jesus' teachings, like the Sermon on the Mount that we'll hear, and miracles such as the wedding in Cana, the way that God was calling people into relationship with God and as disciples with one another. Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. lived into his calling, challenging us to be reconciled to God and one another no matter the color of our skin, our economic or social status, or our religion. He was a disciple of Jesus. Jesus, who gave us a way out of fight or flight. That's our amygdala brain, you know. That's our response to things, fight or flight. And he gave, Jesus gave us an alternative. And Martin Luther King Jr. was simply picking up on that same message and giving it to all of, our, all of us in our society. And, you know, Jesus was killed for all of that, and so was Martin Luther King. But... We can't stop because this is the calling that we have to be reconciled to one another, be reconciled to God, not alienated. So may we give thanks today for Martin Luther King's witness, for the witness, the foundation that John the Baptist gave to all of us in this gospel, that God is among us, works in us and through us, through the Holy Spirit, so that we may show compassion to others through our actions and, and also uh, through our loving ways of justice in our communities and society. May God bless us, and may God bless you. Amen. enlightening words this morning. There was way more in that passage than I noticed tonight, that's for sure. Okay, uh, it's time in our service for the joys and concerns to be expressed. Um, Paul or Ann, you want to microphone us? Joan?
Yes, I'd like everybody to pray for my brother-in-law, Tom, who has just lost his second brother in two months. So, um, you know, it's just sad. His brother was his is, was not mentally there, and he was my brother-in-law's shadow growing up and when he first started dating my sister. So just for him and his family, it's the Fichter family. Thank you. Just uh, explaining and telling you folks uh, that don't know, my mother-in-law has been in, put in hospice care as of uh, Friday. She uh, was a member of this church for many years. So uh, keep the family uh, in your, her, their prayers, and we would appreciate it very much. Thank you. My sister-in-law, Diane's sister, Wendy, was diagnosed with stage four pancreatic cancer this past week. So we want to keep Wendy in our prayers. And I, I just want to share this with everyone. Um, as most of you know, I taught at Central Square for centuries. I was up there yesterday. We have a basketball tournament every year to raise money for cancer awareness. We had one of our players who uh, played for us and then coached with us and taught with us and she died of cancer much too young. So every year they have a little tournament. Yesterday the tournament's focus was on a nine year old boy who's in Central Square schools who has uh, cancer in his lungs. Last year he lost his mother to COVID and he's living with his grandmother and his grandmother's not well and the father is not around. So I'd like you to keep him in thoughts and prayers as well because it's a he's an adorable little rascal friends let us pray Gracious, loving, and merciful, forgiving God. We lift up those today who are ill, memory of those who have died. We lift up the today ourselves that you may, as our epistle reading says, strengthen us for this journey and that you give us a light heart, O oh God, that we may seek you in joy and share with others out of our compassion and love of you. O oh God, sometimes we, we don't have the words. Sometimes the world is just too big for us. It's overwhelming. Help us to be mindful that we were all human in one condition and that we can help alleviate suffering and pain by simply being present with others as you are present with us. We don't have to be heroes. Oh God, let us be your disciples. As we say the prayer Jesus taught us to pray, our Father who art in heaven, Hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts, as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not to temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. I'd like to remind everyone on the way out to drop off your tithes and offerings in the basket in the narthex. And for those of you that are at home,
you can mail them to us at the church at 823 Franklin Park Drive. That's East Syracuse 13057. Thank you. like to especially thank Christy and the choir for that terribly relevant song about peace on earth and glory on high as we celebrate Dr. King's birthday today and the celebration of it publicly tomorrow, but please let us keep that in mind and throughout our days and lives ahead as we're living that message out. All right, would you please rise as you are able and join me in the doxology. <laughs>
Enveloped in your light, O God, may you be a beacon to those in search of light. Sheltered in your peace, may you offer shelter to those in need of peace. Embraced by your presence, so may you be present to others. Amen. Go in peace. I think we missed the dedication. Now, so I'm going to, I'm going to say the dedication, and then we can do the last song. Bless, O Lord, the, the, the gifts and offerings, that they may be a sign of our intent to serve you. Use them with us to bring good news to the poor, proclaim release to the captives, and bring wholeness and healing to all who are hurting and oppressed. If one of your people suffers, we all suffer. But if one of your people is honored, we all rejoice together. In your name, amen. Amen. God says it's a bad thing. <laughs> and now our last hymn is number 725. Arise, shine out, your light is come. Here's a simple one. May the grace of God, the love of Jesus Christ, and the fellowship of the Spirit be with you all today, tomorrow, and always. Amen. All right. <laughs>